rise for the reading of the scripture. Acts chapter 4, 32 through chapter 5, 5, and chapter 6, 1 through 4, and verse 7. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, Choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesse, for reading our scripture this morning. Let's pray once again. Father, take this moment, speak to all of our hearts, speak your individual message to each and every one of us, we pray through your word. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I've told this story before, but it's been so long ago that some of you are newer to the church and you didn't hear it, and hopefully those of you who have heard it won't remember it. So, uh, a young man worked at a supermarket. He worked in the produce department. And he tried to help people, of course, like you would, and he kept all the fruits and vegetables looking nice. And a, a little old lady came into, the church, came into the supermarket, and she looked around, and she came up to him and said, young man... I would like to buy half a grapefruit. He said, I'm sorry, ma'am. We don't sell halves of grapefruit. So sometimes we'll sell half of a watermelon, but we don't sell grapefruits in half. She said, young man, I'm older. I don't eat much. A whole grapefruit would spoil. I need half a grapefruit. I want to buy half a grapefruit. I'm sorry, lady. I can't help you. We don't sell halves of grapefruit. I want to speak to the manager. So he says, okay, I'll go get him. So he huffs back to the manager's office, swings open the door, says, some stupid idiot out here wants to buy half a grapefruit. Unknown to him, the little lady had followed him and was standing right beside him. And he said, and this sweet little lady wants to buy the other half. <laughs> We all have to deal with oppositional circumstances or people in our lives. That's a little stretch of a segue, don't you think? But anyway, it's true, isn't it? Things will be going along swell. Not a cloud in the sky. It's like Oklahoma. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Everything's going our way. And then, bam, 
It's like hitting a brick wall. My intention this morning is to give you some guidelines from Scripture about dealing with opposition. And some of these will be transferable to uh, personal circumstances, but most of these deal with, as we read through the stories, with specific teaching related to opposition in the church. We spent the Lenten season, as I've reminded you, about preaching through the book of Acts, and so I decided why not continue preaching from the book of Acts uh, about the story of the early church until we get to the day of Pentecost, which is May 19th, by the way. So that's what we're doing. We preached from chapter 3 last week, if you remember, about the man born lame who was begging outside the temple. And Peter and John spoke words of healing, power over him, power in the name of Jesus. And so we use that story to talk about the needs of people outside these walls, opportunities to share the help, the grace, the power of Christ in the lives of other people. We talked about the reaction of the Sanhedrin towards Peter and John after the healing of this man when we were going through the Lenten series. And if you remember, that was the first expression of opposition that the early church experienced. Everything really had been a beautiful morning up to that point. Initially, the opposition facing the church came from the outside. The Sanhedrin had Peter and John whipped. And remember, Luke tells us that Peter and John and the other believers rejoiced. Why? Because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. So they passed that test with flying colors. It's easy to tell who your opponent is when your adversary comes from the outside. What about when things happen internally? That's what we discovered in this passage we just read from the fourth, fifth, sixth chapters of the book of Acts. We looked at a couple of stories, really. And the first story we looked at, and we only read a part of the story, deals with a married couple who were leaders in the early church, Ananias and Sapphira. All of the believers were living in one accord. That's what it said back in chapter 4. Remember, everything was hunky-dory. They were holding hands around the campfire, singing Kumbaya. You know, everything was great, okay? And they shared everything freely. And some of them, even like Barnabas, who we read about, sold their possessions or land that they owned, and they brought it to the apostles so that everybody's needs could be taken care of. And so that's read, and then immediately goes into the story of Ananias. So Ananias saw the way that Barnabas was extolled by the church. Barnabas was praised and esteemed because of his gift. And so he also sold some property, but he kept some of the proceeds back for himself. But then he presented the gift in church as if he was giving it all, just like Barnabas had done. And he was judged by God severely and immediately. Notice what Peter said. He told Ananias the money was his to do with as he wished. It was, it was at his disposal. He was completely free to do with his money, with his possessions, whatever he desired. But he wasn't allowed to bring lying and dishonesty and hypocrisy into the body of Christ, the church family. It wasn't that he didn't give everything. It was that he lied, what Peter says, lied to the Holy Spirit and also to his church family. You know, it's those kind of times when we, I mean, have you ever gotten so confused in your thinking that you think, oh, I'll just hide this from God? <laughs> like you can hide anything from God. And that's what he did. Uh, he tried to pretend he was something he wasn't. He exhibited great pride. Okay. Now, I want you to notice the way it's worded. It doesn't say God struck him dead. It said as he's confronted, he just dropped dead. Maybe, maybe he just was so uh, devastated or whatever because he'd been found out. We don't know, but he did die. And that's interesting in the story. Let's talk about that a second. So Satan had realized that external opposition 
from the Sanhedrin and from others who were coming against the church didn't cause fear or conflict within this small group of believers. So if he couldn't get to the early church through external persecution, then he would try to cause internal dissension. So this story we read about Ananias and Sapphira is a story of moral corruption and compromise. It was Satan's attempt to ruin the Christian fellowship of the early church. And so the result obviously seems very harsh to us, perhaps, but it demonstrates how seriously God takes this idea of unity in Christian fellowship. He would not allow such corruption to seep into the church during this important infancy stage. Now, having read the story, and everything has been hunky-dory, it's, sometimes it's hard to figure out the ways of God. It's a pretty harsh story, very harsh story heard about a young pastor who was preaching from this passage, and he was having a tough time explaining it to his congregation. He was very nervous, and so what came out of his mouth, he said, God doesn't strike people dead for lying the way he used to. And then his thoughts got jumbled. He realized he didn't know what to say next, so this is what came out. If he did, where would I be? And the people in the congregation began to laugh, and so he thought of a quick response. I'll tell you where I'd be. I'd be right here preaching to an empty building. (laughs) That's not the way I feel about you, but... What what can we gain from this? God has called us to live as authentic people. 1 John 1, 7, I love this verse, says this, If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, Then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So walking in the light means you're you're showing who you are. You're walking in the light. Sometimes, if we're not careful, the church can become the place where we are the most inauthentic. We come with smiles on our faces, even if our lives are crumbling on the inside. But we need honesty. We need openness. We need vulnerability. We need fellowship. And as we walk in the light, see in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and we need the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all our sin, which is how that verse closes out. All of us. But to have that, we must walk in the light, just as He is in the light. So the first example of internal opposition in the early church is blatant sin open lying, crass hypocrisy. The second example we have in these verses are problems. Human needs that create problems. You know, we like to think of the early church not having a lot of problems. Yeah, the early church had problems. Does that surprise you? Chapter 6 begins with these words. In the message, it says this way. During this time, as the disciples were increasing in numbers by leaps and bounds, oh boy, listen to the next phrase, hard feelings develop. New Living Translation, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. What was happening? It was still just Jewish converts to the Christian faith at this point in the book of Acts. But you had the Hebraic Jewish widows who lived in Jerusalem, who still spoke Hebrew. And you had a whole collection of outside Jews that had come from other parts of the world that spoke Greek. They didn't speak speak Hebrew any longer. And there was dissension because the the widows that spoke Greek felt like they weren't being treated fairly, weren't being treated the same way that the Jewish women who spoke Hebrew. And so there was dissension. It's like we read about. Have you ever been in a church where some hard feelings developed, like they said? Where there were rumblings of discontent? I think I've told this story too. So you probably get tired of hearing the same stories. But um, in my early church, uh, Cotton Center, as a young pastor, there were a group of deacons there. I didn't know when I got there. Five on one side, three on the other side. And so I just tried to pass them, shoot down the middle. I should have confronted them 
There was one deacon on one side and one deacon on the other side that wouldn't even talk to each other. So I was only there two and a half years. As I get ready to leave, one of the deacons I love dearly, I won't give you the long version of the story, I was talking to him as I was getting ready to leave the church, and I talked about these two men. I said, what do you think? Uh, Paul, do you think Kenneth and his wife will ever get over what's happened in this whole thing that caused all this conflict? He said, yes, Brother Rick, I think with prayer and everything, they, they will get over it. I said, what about Henry? Do you think Henry will get over it? And his response was, Brother Rick, Henry wasn't over it before it ever happened. So, <laughs> I'll always remember that. That's just the way some people can be sometimes. The early church was trying to adjust to rapid change and rapid growth, dealing with people and their preferences. And some people were getting their feelings hurt because they didn't think they were being treated as well as some others. And in reality, maybe they weren't. Because you have a language barrier, for one thing. So what do you do? If Satan cannot stop the church through direct frontal assaults of persecution, if he can't do it through moral corruption and compromise, then he'll try something as simple as distraction. Getting the church's vision off of its true goal. See, the danger is division by getting them distracted. Looking at this one problem, and the apostles say, look, we need to be about preaching the Word and praying. We've got to solve this. this. This doesn't need to cause a division. So getting the church's vision off the true go. And what does this story have to say to us about how to handle those problems that arise in any and every church? Well, what do we learn in this story? How to handle the problems that arise. For the first is the need for delegation. The apostle said, we can't do it all. If we try to do it all, we'll get off the main go, we'll be involved in little skirmishes and, and trying to put out all these fires, and, and, and we'll get off task, and we can't do it all anyway. We didn't, we're just one person. We can't do it. We need to spend time in studying. We need to spend time teaching the Word of God and praying. So choose people in the story. They said choose people full of the Holy Spirit and good sense. And that's what we have in this church. I don't do it all. I wouldn't even try to do it all. I couldn't do it all. I don't want to do it all. It, that's not the way the church is supposed to be. I have so many people here who help and are involved. We have a pastor. We have elders. We have deacons. We have church leaders, we have an administrative assistant, uh, even they can't do it all. That's why the church, in this church, we have committee chairpersons who lead ministry teams like worship and stewardship and property and outreach. We have a woman who's taken the lead for vacation Bible school. We have a praise team that sings on Sunday morning. We have children's church teachers and people who do the children's moment. We have middle, new middle school ministry directors who are leading that ministry. We have a CWF leader. We have board members. We have a ministerial assistant who can preach so I can feel comfortable taking a Sunday off. Thank you very much, Tim. We need everybody doing their part to fulfill the ministry. And the second thing is keeping the main thing the main thing. If churches, any church that gets into skirmishes or whatever, they've gotten their vision off the main thing. Now they're talking about this, and we should be looking at this. Problems must be dealt with. People's feelings and needs must be considered. But the bottom line is, we have to keep the main thing the main thing. And so these seven people served the table so that the apostles could keep proclaiming the Word of God. They worked together to resolve the problem. You know what? I not only believe God wants to grow this church, I believe He already is growing this church. I mean, do you believe that? Not just bringing new people into our church family, but also all of us 
growing spiritually in grace and truth. If we take seriously our need for internal spiritual growth, then God will add to this church those who are being saved, which is what the book of Acts says. But to experience the growth that God wants to bring, we must work together to solve problems. That begins with, and that means having a servant's heart. We have so many people in this church that have a servant's heart. That means volunteering to be a part of what God is doing and wants to do here at Hill Country Christian Church. So you've got the message. We need volunteers for Vacation Bible School. If that doesn't sound like something in your wheelhouse, but you're willing to try, please, please volunteer and sign up. That means putting personal preferences aside and doing what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. The promise of God to the people of Judah in the book of Jeremiah is a promise given in a historical context to a specific group of people, but I believe we can claim that for ourselves because it's based not on our worthiness, but on the very character of God. God, speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, said this, For I know the plans I have for you. Plans for welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Let's live out that future together, not letting any opposition, whether it's external or whether it's internal, anything hinder us from reaching the goal that God has for us, both individually, as a person, and as a church family here at Hill Country. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the wonderful stories in Your Word. Some of them are hard to understand, and certainly get our attention. And yet there's, there's, there's a principle there. There's something we can learn from that. And these two stories in the book of Acts today, Lord, uh, just help us to take it to heart. To look at our own hearts. To look at how what was said through Your Word today might speak to us uh, individually. And thank You, Lord, for the way You're blessing our church. We praise You for that. In Jesus' name, Amen. Um, our song today, that uh, hymn, uh, that certainly fits with uh, the message for today, we're going to sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. If God spoke to your heart today, I'll be here at the front if you want some prayer.